We are in a sermon series called the Sermon on the Mount. We're looking at the words of Jesus, his great epic um, address to his followers, um, where he gives us a, a, um, a, an invitation into being human again. This is a manifesto of discipleship, how to live and breathe in the kingdom of God here and now, wherever we are. Um, and in many ways, as we look today, we're going to see that Jesus gives us a glimpse of God's heart, desire, and intention for humanity and creation. And our job as disciples is to take the biblical narratives and truths and apply them to our lives, to see the world through a biblical lens, to reorder our lives around the truth of Scripture, to confront the false narratives that we have, the cultural formation we've all participated in, and reform our ideas about the way the world works around Scriptures. Are you with me? This is new to some of you, but this is the point of biblical teaching. The point of this today is to give you lens, a lens, a framework to engage, to think through your own life, to do a, a life audit and ask the question, how does the way I live match the way Jesus invites me to live? And then change accordingly in community through the power of the Holy Spirit. Are we awake? So uh, let's read what we're going through today. Matthew chapter five, we're picking up where we left off. We, last week we talked about the light subject of lust and this week we're gonna talk about something even um, int more interesting. It says this, verse 31. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her a victim of adultery and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So we're going to talk about divorce. And uh, this very light subject, considering um, that of the teachings we might uh, want to anchor on, this is one I would like to skip um, because of the complications of this text and in interpretation. I actually think that this text has done a lot of damage in the church. Um, it's done a lot of damage to individuals and families in and outside of the community of God. Um, so we're talking about divorce and how Jesus views this particular subject, but pause, don't check out. I wanna give you a quick disclaimer because it's not what you think it means. And so if you're here and you're single, you've maybe been called to singleness or maybe you're single hoping to get married or maybe you're here and you're engaged or you're, you're married or maybe you've been divorced or maybe you've been divorced and remarried Wherever you find yourself on the spectrum of life, I want to say that this text is for you. And so don't check out, because this has something to do with love and a biblical understanding of marriage um, and divorce and everything in between. I believe God has something for you. So, so lean in, because it's for everyone. And I want to just say, um, for those of, my, those of you who are single, I just want to recognize that the church has done a terrible job with you in particular. Now, before the Reformation, it was single people who were honored more than married people in the church. Do you know that? You got to sit in the front. Because the church honored the, the calling of singleness because Jesus was called to celibate singleness as, long as, as, as well as Paul. Um, and then the Reformation came and things changed. And then in a modern day world, it seems like single people are treated as second class citizens in the church. It's like your, your usefulness is, uh, is only good until you can get married. And I'm sorry that that's been the case. We will do better here. And I just want to say, for those of you that are divorced, I already have something coming for you at the end if we get through it. I don't know how long it's going to go. I've got a lot to say. But I want to say, I'm sorry for how the church has really screwed you up. As a, a, a child of divorced parents, I watched our church, which was small, do a terrible job of walking with my mom and walking with my dad and walking with my brothers and I. And it seems like what happens is you get in relationships and then divorce takes place and your married friends continue on with their life and you get left alone along the side. And we've done a terrible job in the garden walking with divorced people and I wanna do better. So I'm sorry for the ways that we've hurt you and we haven't handled it. Maybe it has to do with this text. 
So I want to I want to break down this text. Are you guys okay with that? All right. So um, let's just recognize that this text is difficult and challenging. So we need God's grace. So Holy Spirit, give us grace. <laughs> May you just do what you do, God, and bring this into a beautiful architecture for the people of God. Amen. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1, is what Jesus quotes in the beginning when he says, you have heard it said, or it has been said. It's from the Old Testament, from the Torah, from Moses. And Deuteronomy, I want to read this because it's, it's fascinating. Deuteronomy 21, 24, verse, um, verse 1, it says this. Remember that. Uh, it says, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him, because he finds something indecent about her. Circle indecent. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house. And if after she leaves his house and becomes a wife to another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, or if he dies... Then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring the sin upon the land of the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Okay, Deuteronomy 24. So right away what you need to know is this Moses is not talking simply about when divorce is okay and when it's not. He's actually giving provisionary laws for the aftermath of divorce. In the Old Testament, He's mitigating the, the devastating effects upon women in particular in ancient society. Moses is saying you need to at least give her a certificate that releases her from marriage, from your marriage, so she can be free to remarry, to prevent the devastation of not being married upon her life because it was okay for men to not be married. They could remarry anyone. But women were seen as damaged goods. They were considered property in much of ancient Near, Near Eastern culture. And if a woman was divorced, if she didn't have family, she was usually led to the streets or prostitution. So at the very least... This is a provisionary law to protect the dignity of women. Now, a quick note, those of you that are new to the scriptures. You read this and you're like, oh my goodness, this is the Bible? Is anyone else like, wow, this seems archaic? Like, this is, there's, if you, if you read Deuteronomy, there's a lot more provisionary laws in there that are quite um, offensive to everyone today. But when you read it in Old Testament context, what you have to understand is that was revolutionary. That 3,000 years ago when this was written, this document was so progressive that back then women were not even equal. They were seen as property. They were a little more important than animals or livestock. This is all true. And what you see in the Old Testament is God is drawing, he's leading, he's pulling culture forward towards a redemptive and restorative vision of humanity. So if you read Deuteronomy 24 in context of what was happening in culture, you think, wow, this is life-giving and progressive and redemptive. This is moving towards a goal. It's clearly not all the way there. Are you with me? Like, would you agree that this is not all the way there? I'll give you another example. We're going to create a new society. We'll start with a, a couple of basic rules. Thou shall not murder. Yep, that's a good one. All right, guys, we're going to live together as a community. Our law here is we can't kill each other. Yes, Darren, that's a really good idea. Do you think if we judge the success of our new society and culture by the people that we didn't kill, it was good enough? No, thank you, one person thinking. We're like, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, yes, there's truth to that. But, but when you look at it in context, these laws, these Old Testament commands, in context of where society and culture was 2,000 years ago, it was a progressive document pulling culture towards a redemptive vision. And that redemptive vision is also God's original intent found in Genesis 1 and 2. 
When you go to Genesis 1 and 2, you see this, this dream that God had breathed into life, that God created humanity for perfect loving relationships, a place in Eden where we could work and live and grow in relationship with God, ourselves, and each other, and the rest of creation, and that was destroyed through sin, and evil worked its way into every aspect of the human dimension and soul and society, but what you see is from Genesis 3 on, God pulling culture towards this redemptive vision, and he he pulls it so like things like thou shall not murder when you get to Jesus he'll say it's not about not murdering each other it's about not having inappropriate anger is that a step forward in the right direction yes or no yes and then you get to John 13 and he says no greater love it has somebody than this than to lay down one's life for a friend so you go from thou shall not murder to love one another lay down your lives for one another that is a redemptive uh, uh, direction of pulling culture forward towards God's original intent and desire. You could do this with adultery. We talked about this last week. It says, hey, the success, imagine if you're getting married and you stand before a pastor and he's like, okay, brothers and sisters, we are going to judge the success of your marriage by, by this one command. Don't commit adultery. How silly is that? Now, that would be the definition of your success in marriage. And, and, but that's, that's a provisionary law. That's a law that pulled culture forward. Have one wife. We could have one husband. Don't commit adultery. But then you get to Paul and this New Testament redemptive vision. And he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. The image of that you now have is not don't commit adultery, the image of Jesus laying down his life for the church and the church submitting and sacrificing their lives on behalf of Christ. There's this mutual, living, loving relationship going on. That's the new vision of a restored humanity. Are you guys with me? So as we approach scripture, we have to ask the questions of context. And so this is what's going on in Deuteronomy. It's a massive leap forward. And we have to see that Jesus comes to speak to the heart of God's desire for humanity. He's calling us towards original intent. Let me give you one more example of how we miss it. And this is probably more relatable. Um, for example, when you get to the Old Testament, you see this law, observe the Sabbath, right? Sabbath is a day of rest that God gave humanity um, it is a day, day designed to restore humanity, to remember that we are made in God's image. We are not products of what we produce. And we've been freed and liberated from Israel, or, or I'm sorry, from Egypt and, and sin. And so we take a day every week to rest, knowing who we are and whose we are. Now, what happened over time at the time of Jesus, by the time we get to Jesus, is you have all these debates about what, what qualifies as work? In fact, by the time of Jesus, the rabbis and the Pharisees took this command of rest. Think about that. We are commanded to rest and made it about what is classified as work. And they had 39 categories for work and what you were prohibited to do on the Sabbath day. Rather than focusing on the gift of rest, they created rules and regulations to keep you from working. Are you with me? That you could follow the law but miss the heart of God. And that's what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount. He keeps bringing it back to the heart of God so he'll confront the Sabbath in other, other parts of of the scriptures, but we're talking about divorce. So when you get to Moses, and uh, when you get to this passage in Matthew chapter five, what you have is something going on in Jesus's day that he actually addresses and answers questions that were brought to him. And so I don't want you to miss the point because if you try to read this text and say, okay, what are the justifiable reasons I can get out of my marriage? You will miss the point of this text. When Moses empowered divorce, it was a massive leap forward at his time. You had to give a woman a certificate. This was about treating women with dignity and rights and providing ways for them to not be oppressed or objectified or marginalized in their society. And Jesus actually talks about why Moses gave this law and this command. If you look in Matthew chapter 19, go there with me. We're doing a quick Bible study. Matthew 19, it says this. Um, Matthew, in 19, he says, uh, someone asks him in verse, we'll look at verse seven. 
the Pharisees ask him this question, why then, speaking to Deuteronomy 24, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, when Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone, and he goes on, it talks about what he talks about in Matthew chapter five. In other words, what Jesus says is Moses permits divorce because of the hardness of hearts, but he makes this point, this was not God's intent. Jesus is saying, and I need you to hear this, stay with me, please. God accommodated to his people. God accommodated his desires for humanity and the way that would allow humans to flourish out of his perfect covenantal love because of the effects of sin and brokenness in humanity. And you see this in this text. Divorce is not his desire. Marriages, onenesses, which we'll talk about in one second. But God accommodates. What do I mean accommodates? God gives in and creates a way when that's not his desire. Where do you see this? Well, you see it all over the scriptures, but where do you see it most? Jesus on the cross. God accommodates to the brokenness of humanity by taking on the sin of humanity and offering us a way forward. And what's that way forward called? Do you guys know what the word is? Grace. So even in the Old Testament, What you could say is the certificate of divorce, although it was not God's way, it is a form of God's grace in accommodation. Are you guys good with this? I know. It was was all week. I'm like, oh my goodness. Divorce wasn't his intention. Marriage was God's intention. But out of sin and brokenness, divorce becomes permissible under certain situations. Now, what we do as humans is we want to find out what are those legitimate situations so we can opt out of divorce and justify our behaviors. But we, um, and, the, and, and what we've done is we've confused the text. And in and, and many ways, what we've done is be, uh, we, we've just bought into a cultural understanding of love and marriage, and we've dismissed the biblical authority altogether, which is a whole other discussion, but we're confused about divorce in the church. I believe we're confused about it because we're confused about love and marriage in the church. And what we've done is we, we've allowed culture to hijack the story we get to tell. The greatest love story and the greatest story of commitment of marriage and oneness. And instead, as Christians, we have been deformed by the cultural narratives of the world. And so rather than walking around with the conviction of marriage being a biblical mandated thing, we enter into society living out a cultural view of marriage and love and everything else. I mean, think about this for a moment. What has formed you more, the scriptures or Disney fantasy storytelling? Hollywood romantic comedies. Netflix. Amazon Prime, love novels. What shapes your image of love in marriage? Is it the grounded text of the Bible or is it the latest Netflix comedy series, romantic comedy series? Jesus, he keeps, let's go up Matthew 19. Look at what he says. So right before that passage, Matthew 19, verse three, it says, some Pharisees came to him to test him. So now they're questioning him. They ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife and, uh, for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So Jesus, when questioned about divorce, he gives them a theology of marriage, right? So he elevates um, the 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 uh, a view of marriage over the questions of divorce. Now Jesus is quoting a ton of Old Testament texts. He's quoting Genesis, and he's framing a uh, counter cultural narrative to his day. At the time of Jesus, Pharisees believed you can divorce your spouse for any reason at all. 
Um, and, and it was this big debate in the Old Testament. I'm gonna skip ahead in my notes. Um, so if you have the slides, I wanna, I wanna look at some of these debates. So people were confused in the Old Testament because the Mishnah, the oral tradition, had all sorts of debates for why people could get divorced. And um, there was this debate from Deuteronomy 24 around the word indecent. That word is very difficult to translate in Hebrew and in English. And at the time of Jesus, rabbis debated this. So this is what the Pharisees are doing. They want to know what, what side he takes. Hillel, believe this. You could divorce your wife for any reason at all. And I quote from the oral tradition, the Mishnah, even if she oversalts your food, you are free to divorce her. Akiba said, even if he found someone else prettier than her, she. So if a, a man in, in Jesus' time, in the Jewish tradition, they, could, all they, they didn't have to go to court. They could just give them a certificate of divorce. If they don't remarry, they could reclaim her up to five years later like a piece of property because they translated this word from Deuteronomy 24 to be anything. And they made categories, including messing up your food. Can you, are you kidding me? Shammai said, the house of Shammai, one of the rabbis at the, be the time before Jesus said it was only for adultery. So when Jesus says, hey, in, in, chapter, in verse 32, that it's only for those who have committed adultery, that word pornea, um, he's, 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 he's siding with the more conservative view. In almost every other account where Jesus is asked to debate whether it was Hillel or Shammai, um, he almost always sides with Hillel, except here. He lands on the far more conservative perspective. Why? Because he thinks marriage is a really, really big deal. Matthew 19, Jesus reaffirms the biblical narrative. He quotes a bunch of texts. And for the sake of time, why don't, why don't we look at what Jesus says about marriage. There's three fundamental things I want you to know. Number one, God created male, this is from that, I'm gonna summarize. God created male and female to, uh, in his image to govern the world on his behalf. So male and female are made in the image of God. Number two, God created men and women to live in covenantal loving relationship. Genesis 2 verse 18 says, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper. So Adam uh, goes to sleep. God creates Eve. And in the Old Testament language, um, when, G, when, when, when Adam sees Eve, he says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha, which is a uh, woman because she was taken out of man. That language, is he's not naming her. He doesn't get the, she doesn't get the word Eve until... Genesis 3, when sin enters into the story, in the original intent, we're designed for mutual submissive relationships, not one over the other. No one rules over each other. We collaboratively rule the world together on God's behalf. How are we doing, church? That's what the intent, covenantal loving relationships. Number three, a covenantal marriage, according to Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, between a man and a woman reflects God to the world. Pay attention to verse 24. It says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. That word one, there was different Hebrew words for the word one. It's used in Deuteronomy 6, 4. It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In other words, when that writer of Genesis, Moses most likely, uses that particular word one, he's having signs, red flag, like, like signal. This is a really big deal. One, where... Uh, is it that that word's used? Well, it's used every single day by every single Jewish boy and girl and every person in the Jewish community recited multiple times a day for the Shema prayer. Our Lord, our God is one. That word is a oneness made up of many different parts and members. It is the declarative state of allegiance to God. And when, when the writer of the Old Testament uses it for marriage, he's saying your marriage reflects God's oneness to the world. So God's original signpost for the world is marriage between a man and a woman and the covenantal loving relationship that they are designed to have. That image, that covenantal love reflects God's covenantal love to the rest of the cosmos. So when Jesus says and rebukes the Pharisees, he's saying marriage is a really big deal. Let no one separate what God has put together, what God has joined. So how can we simply look to justify 
divorce. That's not what Jesus is doing. He's confronting an issue in his day. So we get to Matthew 5, 32. It says, I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual morality makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who divorces a divorced woman, a divorced woman, anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. When we read this passage, it raises all sorts of questions. He's on face value what Jesus is saying. It sounds like that you can only get divorced if you've, your spouse had an affair. And even if that happens, it's remarriage is, is going to be adultery either way. That's what he's saying, according to the text. That's harsh, isn't it? It's a tough, tough pill to swallow. People ask questions um, like, what about abuse? What about physical or emotional or verbal abuse? What about desertion? What about all sorts of scenarios where men and women are operating outside of God's desire and intent for covenantal loving relationship? Now, I can't answer all those questions. In fact, I read a ton on it and it breaks my heart because there are so many reasons that we see today people operating outside of God's desire in marriage relationships. We are all, no people, we've been exposed to them. We have experienced that type of brokenness in our society and culture. And I wanna give you a resource. If you have any stake in the game, if you've been divorced and have any questions, there's this really short but great book called Divorce and Remarriage in the Church by David Instone Brewer. And it's an incredible theological conversation around what Jesus is going after here. But rather than give you a comprehensive, you know, answering all the questions, what's justified, that's not the point of this text. So if you look at this text and think, oh, he gives us the justification for divorce. When can I get divorced? The one-liner, if somebody had an affair, you're missing the point. Jesus is addressing the, the cultural conversation at the moment. He's weighing into a political debate, by the way. This political debate, by the way, you're gonna love this, had radical implications for the marginalized and oppressed. You think, oh, the gospel is not political. This was a highly politically debated subject, and Jesus, in this moment, sides with the marginalized and the oppressed. Are you with me? Now, this might sound offensive because I'm using language that we want to take and say, what does he mean by that? Staring is a woke church. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, according to Scripture, Jesus is saying, at a time when there was an overwhelming uh, sense of lust and easy divorce culture, that easy divorce culture, because of lust and the objectification of primarily women, empowered primarily men to oppress women and leave them on their own. They were after they were divorced. They were the primary place they went is to a family member that could take care of them, and if they didn't have a family member, they became prostitutes. That's it or they died in poverty. So Jesus is saying the conservative answer here is only adultery. He's addressing all the marginalization and oppression that was taking place because of this liberal use of this word indecent by the political and religious leaders of the day who didn't care for the marginalized. Are you with me, church? So if you wanna know which, when can I get divorced, that's not the question here. You can go and read a theological study, but the point is this, is he's calling his followers to a whole new view of marriage, not one that's contract, not one that allows you to opt out because you feel good or it doesn't feel good or you're not so happy and culture's taught you to be happy and your spouse should make you happy. Instead, he's inviting you to see marriage as a covenant, a meaningful commitment, a promise that you keep every single day until death do you part, no matter what. That's the invitation. And that, that idea of covenant, this covenant understanding of love means that marital love reflects God's love, which, mean, which means divorce destroys the reflection of God who is utterly faithful. Are you with me? Marital love must be defined by God's love. So what does God's love look like? His covenantal love has three components I want you to see real quick as we talk about marriage. And we'll come into land in just a second. We'll talk about the implications. God's covenantal love has three components according to scripture. Number one is that God covenants to be with us. Number two is God covenants to be for us. And number three is God covenants to be unto us until the full restoration of our Christ-likeness. So in other words, there's three words that help you understand covenant love. Number one is God's presence. He covenants to be with us. Number two is God's advocacy. He, he covenants to be for us. And number three is formation. God covenants to help form us into Christ-likeness. 
Scott McKnight says, marital love then is defined by God's love. Our love for our spouse is to be with them, to be for them, to be unto God's formation, pur- formative purpose for each of us. So in other words, when we talk about marriage, and you talk about the relational conflicts that you have in your marriage, for those of us that are married, the question you should be asking is, have I been, fi- have I been fulfilling the covenantal love that God has done to me? Am I with my spouse? Am I for my spouse? And am I helping them become more like Jesus in my relationship with them? How's that for questions? How's that for your, after your five A's of affirmation, affection, all those things? If you start asking and doing self-inventory, as you, if those of you who are married, to ask the question, am I present? Am I an advocate? Am I partnering in the formation of Christ-likeness? This is what the goal of marriage is. So in summary, let me just say this. Jesus is against divorce, but he, uh, and he's for marriage. And he believes marriage is sacred and holy and never to be broken it's, never to be, it's a union that you've created with man, uh, your spouse, I'm sorry, and God as you become one flesh, but also because he believes in marriage and, um, and he believes that divorce is contrary to God's creative design. But Jesus, as well as God's grace, as well as God's grace, accommodates the pain and fallen humanity and evil that's around us. He allows for divorce. He allows for remarriage based on very different circumstances, things like adultery, but it's not limited to adultery. And I know some of you need to hear that. And I just wanna say, what does this mean for us today? Number one, we're called to form our lives around the biblical truth and ask the question, am I operating out of God's heart and desire for my marriage or in my life? How, do I need to realign, realign my understanding of love and marriage based on biblical truths? Or am I adopting the cultural formation? Number two, we need to honor marriage and keep it holy and sacred. We have to fight for marriage as as much as we can to stay in our union with our spouse. Number three, if you've been divorced, if you've been divorced and it's outside of those justifiable reasons and remarried, what are you to do? Because I know a lot of us are here and we've been divorced and remarried. Well, number one, I think, is to ask the question, how can I now in this new covenant honor marriage? How can I now reflect God's love for my spouse? May I invite you, because you have a previous marriage, to let go of the old and step into the new as sacred and holy and let God's covenantal love form your new marriage. Yes, we're all sinners. We are all consumers of grace. Is this a sin that's like a scarlet letter that keeps you from participating in the body? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I just want to say, I feel like this particular text has done so much damage, and here's how it works. Number one, we don't know how to walk in relationship with people who are being divorced in community. We take sides and we dismiss both. Maybe one's justified, one's not. Brothers and sisters, we have to fight for community and learn to walk with those who have been victims to affairs or divorce and those who have been um, just casually divorced. Either way, we have to learn how to walk with them and hold space even when we disagree with their decisions. Because the damage is so, it's so damaging to the community of God. Divorce is so damaging and the effects are so destructive. But as, as a community, we need to learn to commit to walking with people in the pain, even when it doesn't make sense to us. Does that make sense? This text has been used and misinterpreted to do a ton of damage in the church. It's been used to justify divorce, but it's also been used to force women to remain in marriages that were filled with pain and abuse. It's been used to condemn people. It's been used to treat people like they're they're unforgivable, it's been used for so many reasons, and we got to do better. So at the end of the day, this was a difficult teaching, and I know I, I, it's all over the place in regards to ministry time in the middle of the sermon. I just want to say this. The heart of the teaching is simply to honor marriage. Jesus is clearly against divorce, so we have to protect marriages at all costs. We have to honor all marriages and fight for them to keep them restored because of what they represent. But also in the midst of that, we have to create space to cover those who are lonely and isolated and vulnerable because of what divorce does. And we have to walk with those who are wounded and weak in the midst of it. As a church, we have to have a righteousness like Jesus, but we also have have to have a mercy like Jesus.